Hello and welcome to Am Writing Fantasy. My name is Jesper. If you've been following our series here, you already know that we have been journeying in together through the grand landscape of storytelling structure and delve deep into the complexity of character arcs. But today we are going to embark on a whole new adventure. So grab your pens, your notebooks, and prepare to navigate the intricate labyrinths of subplots and the art of crafting compelling chapters. Yes, you heard that right. Because today we are taking a deep dive into the subtler but equally crucial elements that truly brings a novel to life. And you might be wondering why subplots, why chapters? Well, we've been talking a lot about the main plot so far, and you can think about that as like a grand symphony. It's beautiful, it's captivating, but it's the intricacies, the smaller melodies and harmonies that your, that your subplots, which give it depth and richness. And as for chapters, they're like the rhythm, the pace, they're what keep the readers on their toes eager for the next note of the story. So if you are ready to delve into the secrets of creating subplots that enrich your narrative and crafting chapters that your readers just can't put down, then you're in the right place here. Let's get this story weaving journey started. Before we dive into the mechanics of creating subplots, let's first take a look at J.R.R. Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring. Now, and as we've talked about in the previous videos in this series, the main plot of the Fellowship of the Ring revolves around Frodo's quest to destroy the ring. However, there are several subplots that work in tandem with the main narrative, adding depth and complexity to the story. Firstly, there is Aragorn's subplot. Aragorn is struggling with his destiny to become the King of Gondor. He is reluctant to assume this role due to the past failures of his lineage. Yet, throughout the story, we see him gradually step up to the responsibility and start to embrace his destiny. Then we have Boromir's subplot. He is torn between his desire to use the ring to save his people of Gondor and the understanding that the ring must be destroyed. This internal conflict eventually leads to his downfall, but also his redemption. On a lighter note, we also have the friendship between Legolas and Gimli. Their relationship begins with racial prejudice, but as they face challenges together, they grow to respect and eventually become friends. Another notable subplot involves Merry and Pippin, who begin as light-hearted, somewhat naive hobbits, primarily interested in mischief and fun. But as the story unfolds, they find themselves unexpectedly caught up in Frodo's quest. This subplot traces their journey from carefree hobbits to courageous adventures, highlighting the theme of growth and the unexpected depth of a character. We also have the subplot involving Gandalf's investigation into the true nature of Bilbo's ring. This subplot is woven throughout the first half of the story, building suspense and tension as Gandalf uncovers the terrifying truth, setting the stage for the main plot to unfold. It begins in the Shire at Bilbo's birthday party, where Gandalf first becomes suspicious of the ring's power. From there, Gandalf embarks on a journey on his own, separate from Frodo and the other hobbits, and he seeks counsel from his fellow wizard Saruman, only to be betrayed and imprisoned, revealing Saruman's alliance with the Dark Lord Sauron. This subplot adds a level of urgency and danger to the main plot, as Gandalf's discovery confirms the ring's identity as the One Ring, the most powerful and dangerous artifact in Middle-earth. During Gandalf's investigation, we also learn about the history of the ring, and its corrupting influence, which serves to heighten the stakes of Frodo's quest. It's not just a case of taking the ring away, 
It's about preventing a catastrophic shift of power that could plunge Middle Earth into darkness. So this subplot also serves to develop Gandalf's character further. He is shown as a wise and determined figure willing to risk his life to uncover the truth. He's escaped from Saruman and eventually returned to aid Frodo and the Fellowship further underscores his commitment to, the, to their cause. All of these subplots not only enrich the story with additional layers of complexity, but they also enhance the development of individual characters and expand the world building, making the story more engaging and immersive. Now, with these examples in mind, let's delve deeper into how you can create compelling subplots in your own writing. Earlier, I linked subplots to a grand symphony, and for good reason. Getting them right can be trickier than you might think. When subplots don't harmonize the larger context of the novel, it's akin to an instrument that in that orchestra that just like plays out of tune a bit. So the entire composition basically suffers. When done right, however, you don't even notice the individual instruments. Each seamlessly integrates and supports the others. In the same way, we need subplot to bolster the main plot. In many respects, similar to the intro, subplots can be thought of as mini-stories that delve more deeply into characters than the main plot can manage. However, I would advocate for subplots to be linked to the main story thread somehow. If we take the Lord of the Rings example that I just mentioned a moment ago, you'll have noticed how all those subplots tie into the story rather than sitting like as isolated islands outside with no impact on the overall progression of the tale. So at this point, you have all your characters and plot points in place. That's something we discussed in the previous videos. So how can you leverage what you have already and how can you then identify subplots? The first thing you do is investigate the relationship between your characters. Those who have or develop some type of relationship with the protagonist, that well, they make strong candidates for a subplot. I put a couple of questions on the screen for you here. And as you can see, one of them is about a romantic relationship. And now your story might not contain any romance, but then I would challenge you, should it? We always advise authors to include at least one subplot that focuses on courtship and or love. Such elements are just part of our human DNA and by incorporating unresolved romance or sexual tension, you will engage your readers. It works best if it involves the protagonist, but a fling between two secondary characters is still better than nothing. Similar to the example with Gandalf, it's always beneficial to elaborate on point of view characters. Find ways to further explore the inner conflict and character arc of these characters. Just be careful not to spend so much time on secondary characters that they start to feel like the main protagonist to the reader. Thirdly, consider expanding upon the henchmen of the antagonist. Henchmen are not the main antagonistic force, and this fact leaves them relatively unexplored. A subplot can prevent those secondary villains from becoming mere cardboard figures, giving them their own goals and desires that goes maybe against the protagonists will make them come alive. These are just a few ideas on where you can look for subplots. When we run courses for writers, we are then often asked, how many subplots should I create? And it's a good question, but it's also highly dependent on your story. Subplots require a fair amount of dedicated words, so the number your story can sustain depends greatly on its length. To give you a ballpark figure, a full-length novel can typically carry three subplots while a shorter piece of fiction might limit you to one. That said, there is no hard and fast rule. Some subplots take longer to resolve than others, 
So you might want to go with two or even four instead of three. Now let's return to the Fellowship of the Ring once more to illustrate these concepts that I was just talking about. Consider the subplot involving Aragorn and his reluctance to embrace his destiny to become a king. This subplot serves multiple purposes. Number one, it adds depth to Aragorn's character. Number two, it creates additional tension in the story. And number three, it ties in beautifully with the main plot. Throughout the course of the story, we see Aragorn grapple with his fears and insecurities, and by the end, he's ready to finally step up and lead. This subplot not only gives Aragorn a meaningful character arc, but also contributes to the overall theme of the main plot. Subplots, like the one we've just discussed here, are instrumental in creating a rich, engaging, and layered narrative. They provide opportunities to explore different aspects of the character's life, offer additional conflicts and resolutions, and can help to sustain readers' interest throughout your story. Remember, a well-crafted subplot can significantly enhance your main plot and your reader's overall experience. Now that we've delved into the world of subplots, let's move on to the next topic, crafting compelling chapters. I'm going to share our template with you for how to write compelling chapters. But before diving into that, remember that Autumn and I covered this topic in great depth in episode 150 of the Am Writing Fantasy podcast. I highly recommend giving it a listen for a more comprehensive understanding. You'll find a link to that in the description field. Now, let's break down our template. We have five main components. Character goal, the hook, conflict and dilemma, reaction and decision, and finally, the disaster. If you recall what we talked about in the previous video, you'll notice how the plot posts are present even on a chapter level. The intro is represented by the hook. The inciting incident finds its place in the conflict and dilemma. The reaction, new info, and developed plan are encapsulated in the reaction and decision. And the climax is, of course, the disaster. Then. At this point, you might be wondering, what about the wrap-up? Well, in the context of chapters, we replace the wrap-up with a cliffhanger. This keeps the reader hooked and eager to dive into the next chapter. Everything starts with a goal. Without it, it's near impossible to build up any momentum. The character's goal not only justifies what you're going to write, but it also validates the chapter's existence in the novel. However, setting a goal doesn't mean you need to start each chapter with an explanatory paragraph. Instead, dive straight into the action, showcasing the character's objective. There might be instances where the character is not entirely sure what they want, but even so, you as the author need to have a goal in mind when writing the chapter. Only then can you advance the plot in a sustainable way. Otherwise, we get those kind of chapters where characters are just talking, drinking, eating, or something like that, and it's very dull to read and doesn't contribute to the progression of the story. A hook is only effective if it propels the reader straight into the action. Just like when you're starting a novel, the action or event the chapter revolves around should be happening right from the first sentence. If two characters are talking, let the reader join in the middle of the conversation. If it's necessary to add some scene setting because things have changed from the previous chapter, don't just describe it, but weave clues into the action itself. The hook at the beginning of a chapter is meant to pique the reader's curiosity, enticing them to read the next paragraph, then a few more pages, until before they know it, they are fully immersed in your story. While the end of a chapter is designed to make the reader turn the page, the hook is what keeps them there. Next, we delve into conflict and dilemma. This is where tension builds in the form of obstacles and it's what keeps the middle of the chapter moving. 
It might sound easy, but many authors actually struggle with the introduction of conflict. Sometimes there isn't enough of it, with characters easily overcoming any obstacle in their path. More often the issue is the concept of conflict is basically misunderstood. Authors who equate any negative event happening to the character with conflict have misunderstood the concept. And I fully admit in saying this that in the past this was me. But not every negative event counts as genuine conflict. Unless the conflict poses an obstacle to the character achieving his or her chapter goal, which you've already established, then it's not really conflict. And I must raise a few additional warnings here. When conflict arises in the form of relationship problems like husband versus wife or parent versus child or bully versus victim and so on, authors often forget to make the conflict an obstacle to the character achieving their goal. What you end up with are scenes where progress is slowed by pointless arguments. While these scenes might make the reader feel sorry for the character, they don't really move the story forward. So relevant conflict is the engine that drives the story forward, keeping tension high and readers deeply invested. In dealing with the reaction and decision section of the chapter, one might be tempted to solely focus on how the character feels neglecting how the character is attempting to devise a solution to their recent predicament. When the reaction is given more attention than the decision, it portrays a character wallowing in self-pity. Yes, of course, you do need to portray the emotional reaction and let the reader know whether the character is happy, concerned, or experiencing some sort of different emotion. But most writers actually nail this part, so as long as you remember to shift the emotional state, for example, from happy to sad, well, then you're on the right track. More importantly, though, without a swift transition to a proactive response, the chapter's momentum can dissipate as quickly as snow in the sun. It's the decision that creates a new goal and rekindles the narrative energy. This also paves the way to the next chapter, and voila, your chapters progress naturally from one to the next. A conflict causes a decision, which in turn prompts a new goal that sets up the next chapter, and the cycle repeats itself, making the story feel cohesive and organic. It's crucial to ensure that the character is being proactive, with decisions being made based on the character's own ideas and or skills. The final part of your chapter is the disaster. Now, some take the term literally, believing it implies that your character should be physically attacked at the end of each chapter. But that's obviously not the case. What you are aiming for is to persuade the reader into turning the page out of a sheer desire to know what happens next. A cliffhanger ending is the best way to facilitate this reaction, yet it doesn't always mean explosive action or thrilling chases. The disaster can come in many shapes and sizes as long as it propels the plot forward and complicates the character's circumstances. In most cases, the disaster won't alter the new goal set forth by the decision, although it can if necessary. The new goal will often roll straight into the next chapter as the character stays on point, trying to juggle the disaster that just occurred. I've placed some ideas on the screen for you here on how to deal with the disaster part of your chapter. So I thought it would be helpful to end this section by giving you a practical example of how all the elements we've discussed play out in a real chapter. And we've been using The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien as our case study, so let's stick with that once again. 
We'll take a look at chapter two titled The Shadow of the Past. The chapter goal here, well, at the start of this chapter, Frodo's goal is simply to understand the strange ring that his uncle Bilbo has left him. This goal drives the entire chapter and gives it a clear sense of purpose. For the hook, Gandalf's arrival at Bag End and his ominous conversation with Frodo about the ring instantly grabs our attention. We, the readers, are thrust into the middle of the action and we want to know more about this ring and why it is so important. When it comes to the conflict and dilemma, well, as Gandalf reveals the true nature of the ring and the danger it poses, we are introduced to the central conflict of this chapter. Frodo is faced with a difficult choice. Continue his peaceful life in ignorance or accept the dangerous journey that lies ahead. Reaction and decision. Frodo's initial reaction is shock and fear. He wishes the ring had never come to him, but after some contemplation, he makes the proactive decision to leave the Shire, realizing that is the only way to keep his home safe. The disaster. Here the disaster comes in two parts. Firstly, Frodo's peaceful life is completely overturned. And secondly, Gandalf reveals that the malevolent forces searching for the ring are now likely aware of its location. And this ramps up the tension and urgency and leaves us eager to find out what happens next. So by examining the shadow of the past, we can see how each of these five elements plays a crucial role in structuring the chapter. And Tolkien, one of the most revered authors in the fantasy genre, instinctively uses the exact same building blocks that we have discussed here. And this gives his chapters a strong sense of purpose, direction, and conflict, making them an essential part of the overall narrative. Well, that brings us to the end of this video, and I hope you find this deep dive into subplots and chapters enlightening and practical for your own writing journey. Remember, every subplot that you weave and every chapter you structure contributes to the grand symphony that is your novel. If you handle them with care and craft them purposely, your readers will be captivated from the first page all the way to the last one. To learn more about plot development and how to create captivating narratives, be sure to check out our comprehensive plot development guidebook. It's packed with actionable tips and detailed instructions to help you craft a plot that will keep readers riveted. Additionally, we have covered a lot of these topics in the Am Writing Fantasy podcast. Specifically in chapter 150, we delve deep into how to write these compelling chapters. So go and check that out. And also remember to tune in to our Write the Story podcast, where we give even more example as we develop a story on our own from scratch and you get to listen into all of that and you can see how we go about things. All the links are included in the description and uh, thank you for watching and as always, stay safe out there.